tell me a little bit about where you grew up and what life was like. I grew up in a small southern town, Bennettsville, South Carolina, in Marlboro County, county of about 30,000. Um, um, and um, my father was a Baptist minister. My mother was the entrepreneur in the family who did all the fundraising for the church, was a church organist, the Mother's Club founder, um, the Missionary Society head. Um, and it was completely segregated. Um, and um, all the external messages of the segregated South of the um, 40s and 50s told me as a black child I wasn't worth much, but I didn't believe it because I was buffered by the messages and rituals and beliefs and values of my family. I had great parents and by my community co-parents. Um, my Sunday school teachers were my public school teachers um, and the community considered children community property. And so it was very clear about what they wanted for us. It was also very clear what they viewed success as being, which was service um, and a good education and giving back from that good education. And so I've always felt very lucky to be born who I was, when I was, with the parents I had. And then as I got older with the convergence of great historical events and great mentors, role models, um, to be in college in the middle of the civil rights movement um, and to have the Dr. Kings of this world as daily presences in my life and then to go to Mississippi and to have those great women of Mississippi um, be examples. So I've just felt very lucky. You say that you had a sense from society of limitations on you because of your race. How about your gender? Um, I did have that expectation from the outside world, but I had an extraordinary family again. My mother and father were a real partnership. And it was always clear from the beginning that they thought that they're girls. My sister is the oldest. She's 12 years older. We had three brothers in between. And then there was me six years behind everybody else in an accident. But we always knew that we were as smart as our brothers and the expectations by both parents is that we as the two girls in the family would achieve as much as the brothers. And so I now realize how unusual that was. But um, the expectations about education, um, very clear the night my father died, the last messages to me was don't let anything get between you and your education. He always made me believe that I could be anything and do anything and the character and hard work and determination were the the real measures of life. And um, I thought everybody had parents like that. Um, but I realize again um, how um, wonderful the high expectations and the supports were in my family and the relationship that they had. And when my father died when I was 14, my mother didn't miss a beat, even though I mean, they, were, they were real partners. And that was extraordinary. Um, and you say they were emphasizing education. When you started at Spelman, what, what, what was the atmosphere like then? Was the sense of most of your classmates like, we're going to go out and achieve and be professionals? What, 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 was, it, what, were the, what was the level of expectation for us? They wanted a Morehouse man as a husband. <laughs> um, I think I was probably different from many of the young women at Spelman. Um, but I think that the expectations for middle class girls at Spelman, which was a tea party lady, lady school, um, was that we would get a good education, that we probably would become teachers, um, and that if we were lucky, we'd nab a Morehouse man, and if we were even luckier, we'd nab a Harry doctor, um, or a Howard doctor, um, but it was, um, it was pretty traditional. Um, and um, I guess I had always had different aspirations. I had, as a little girl, hid behind a very high hedge when my father I um, was being asked permission for my older daughter to marry, my older sister to marry. I, I, I listened in as she was, he, he had, the, the young man who was asking for my sister's hand from my poor father, from my father was um, um, seeing whether he would let her get married at 23 after she'd been out of college for a, two, three years. She taught for two years at a private girls boarding school and then had taught for a year at Benedict College and my father was not pleased and said, what in the world is she thinking about getting married? You don't, you know, well, why would she be getting married right now? She should be going off to graduate school. Um, he eventually gave his permission, but that really did stick in my psyche, um, having listened um, illicitly behind the head, is that you're supposed to use the education you got, and there's more to be done than just getting married. In Bennettsville, South Carolina, was the idea of a Yale Law School even on the horizon for most people? Law school never crossed my mind. I didn't know any women who were lawyers. 
uh, when I got to be older, and at Spelman, Constance Baker Montley kind of you know, crossed um, my, um, my um, awareness. Um, Yale, I don't think I knew about Yale when I was growing up in a little town of South Carolina. Um, and, um, you know, when I, my father, um, whose guidance I have followed, tried to follow most of my life, really believed that God ran a full employment economy, and if you follow the need, you would never lack for a purpose in life, and that's basically what I've tried to do most of my life. And so I um, was planning to go into the Foreign Service at Spelman. I loved, I was so lucky, thanks to Howard Zinn, to spend the most glorious 15 months of my life abroad, to get outside of those gates um, and all the restrictions and, um, and little preacher's daughter, um, South Carolina town as well, and find myself in Paris and Geneva, but I also knew that I would never fit back into the South. And happily, the civil rights movement and the sit-in movement came about in my senior year in college. And I followed up on that um, by volunteering at the NAACP and seeing all these people who had never been able to get a lawyer and all the complaints of people who, white lawyers didn't take black civil rights cases then, and all these poor people who couldn't afford a lawyer. And I was just shocked and asked myself, what in the world are you thinking about doing to go into foreign service when the real war is at home? And so on a fluke, I got very mad and said, I, I will go to law school, that's what's needed. Um, and I applied without, I only applied to Yale. <laughs> um, had no idea what law school was like. Howard Zen probably helped me fill out the application because we were so busy demonstrating in lots of ways. But I went to law school and um, because I wanted to go to Mississippi. I hated every minute of it, but I went to visit my friends in Mississippi in my first semester in, in law school. Um, and I got, and I, I became very clear about why I was in law school and that I could stick it out. Um, for another th two and a half years um, because there were 900,000 blacks in that state in 1961. There were three black lawyers, all of whom were in, in Jackson, who took civil rights cases. None of them had gone to law school. They were saints. They studied and did the best they could with so little. And that was the first time when I visited Mississippi where I um, met Gail Evers, who um, I love now that the airport is um, um, has got an exhibition for Medgar, um, but he picked me up and took me home to meet Murley and then drove me 90 miles up to Greenville, Mississippi, where my friends from SNCC were and the sit-in kids were. And that was the first time they brought out police dogs, the first news at that first visit. Um, the first hour was of a shooting in town and fear was palpable. But the next day, as we went down to try to convince people to register, to try to register to vote, there were huge crowds, and they brought out the police dogs for the first time, and all of my stick friends were arrested. And I could not get into the courthouse to do anything. I had only a few months of law school, but that consolidated my absolute determination that I'd get through the next couple of years, and I'd come back to Mississippi to practice law. And so I felt very lucky, because Mississippi was the crossroads of change. Um, and probably the most exciting time you could be there. And almost everything I do now at the Children's Defense Fund came out of those two eras, and, and the sit-in movement in Atlanta, and then in that Mississippi period. Um, so I just followed the need. Mississippi had to be almost the least hospitable place it for you horrible. to choose, for you to choose. Of course. What, 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 to t give, me, give me a little broader sense of how you were thinking at that very young age, like this is a choice that I'm going to make and here's why. Oh, there was no question about going to Mississippi after my first visit and I couldn't get in the courthouse and the police dogs were out there and they were trying my friends without lawyers and without bail. Um, that was it. Um, and um, I knew that's where I would come and it was... Um, scary but needed um, and um, I, it was probably one of the most exciting and, and extraordinary times in my life um, and for many people um, and when one it was a totally closed society I mean it was an iron curtain as much like um, what I think folk faced in the Soviet Union um, and um, but when you're 19 or 20 or 21 or 22 or 23 and you're tired of injustice and I've always hated not being able to go anywhere I could wanted to go and could go and anybody else could go and I can't stand to this day any child being excluded from anything. Mississippi was was just the place that was suited for what I wanted to do um, and I'm very grateful for those experiences. Um, it was totally lawless um, but that first experience that, 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 that first year in my law school where I felt what it felt like to be totally isolated and totally alone and totally 
um, at the mercy of, of people who um, hated you. Um, and I don't know how in the world the, the, the people who live there day to day, who didn't know how to get to a phone booth and call John Doerr, um, who didn't um, have the ability to leave in three days, um, but I was just, I was, I was, um, I was, um, that was, that was home. And tell me a little bit about taking the bar, what happened, how that unfolded for you. Well, I tried very hard that night, that first time not to get arrested because I was told I had a very slim chance of getting into the bar in the first place, and if I got arrested, that would be it. Um, so I was trying to be good. Uh, Mississippi had automatic admission, like um, if you went to Ole Miss, you were automatically admitted to the bar. Um, and then you had to take a bar exam if you were from these outside places. And I went through 15 months of a fiction that I was the um, clerk of the three black lawyers who signed all the papers. I did all the work. Um, and we all put up with that fiction. That was fine. I was running a legal factory and, and managing hundreds of volunteer lawyers. Um, and the first time I walked into court, it was very funny. I mean, I set up two law offices before the summer project of 1964, one in Memphis to handle the cases that anticipated out of um, northern Mississippi and then one in Jackson. But I went into Federal Judge Cox's court, who was a very known, well-known racist judge. Um, and went into um, the conference room where all the lawyers were sitting, all white male lawyers. And it was as if a Martian had walked in the house. It was, I could not believe the silence that was, was, was struck, but I went around the table. Um, and I tried to shake hands with every one of them. None of them would shake my hand, um, but that was all right. I didn't know whether this, they were so stunned into silence that it was because I was a woman or whether it was black or the combination, which they'd never seen before. I think Connie Motley had been through there and tried the Meredith cases and a number of other things. Um, but um, we eventually got to know each other. You know, you, you tell that story fairly coolly now. Were you really that relaxed about it? I had left, I had lived with injustice all of my life and always hated it. And I was used to being excluded. I was used to kind of being shut aside. I was used to being not admitted to the library um, when I was a little girl. And I always um, was testing everything. Um, so there was never a time from the time I could toddle or think that I didn't hate segregation. And, um, and these things build up. Um, and there was nothing that I was not prepared to do. And I think that it was extraordinary to be willing to die for something, but, but going to Mississippi and being determined to change, I was very determined. Um, not relaxed, but just determined. And it was no surprise. Um, I had, that had been much of what you got growing up. Um, and so I wasn't surprised to walk into this place and have a hostile set of lawyers or a hostile judge um, or to find hostile police officers or sheriffs. Um, and in many ways, I was lucky being a woman because I got away with things that many black men would have absolutely um, been wiped out if they had tried to do. Um, like what? Oh my goodness, I, I had a dance that I used to go through with Suggs Ingram, who was a really dumb, mean sheriff up in Grenada County. And whenever I'd go to get um, my clients out of Suggs' jail, he would lock the door. And we would go through this thing, I would bam on the door, and Suggs would sit there and ignore me as if I wasn't at the door, and then I would say, Suggs, open up. Then I'd go to the phone, phone booth, um, and I would say, Suggs, open up the cotton-picking door. <laughs> um, and so we would go through this ritual, it was funny, um, and um, I would always beat him in court, but that was a part of the kind of resistance that went on. Um, and, um, but, you know, I was never afraid. Um, and one of the things that happened was there was a community. Um, every night, a debriefing community. I mean, all the SNCC kids, everybody would come back to the office in the evening and say, how was your day? And Stokely was probably the funniest of them because we'd laugh about who got run off for plantation, who just dodged a bullet, um, who had to choose between the mob and the police mob and the regular citizens mob. But that was a part of the expectations of life that four blacks in Mississippi lived with, and we were very clear um, about what we were in the midst of, and we were very determined that we were going to change that. And it was scary in some ways, but we were not deterred by that because folk down there had no choice. And um, your admission to the bar was, was historic. Can you say a little about that? Oh, as the first African-American woman to get admitted to the Mississippi bar. And there were no other women. I don't think I ever saw another woman lawyer any place 
um, in the four years that I stayed in Mississippi, but I guess it was a big deal. But you know, I never thought about being a first of anything. I just kind of did what I had to do to get through um, what I had to do each day. Um, so when I now hear in retrospect that this was historic and that I was the first black woman, that didn't cross my mind at the time. I was wow. just getting in the bar. I had to get in the bar. I was trying to practice law. I was trying to change Mississippi. Um, in fact, I don't think I ever thought about being the first of anything. I just was following the need. And when in Mississippi you started getting a sense of what the conditions were that seems like maybe it was even beyond what you had expected, is that, is that right? Well, Mississippi was extraordinarily poor. I mean, this black population was extraordinarily poor. The plantation system and sharecropping was tantamount to a peanut system. I mean, the first time I went down um, to Mississippi and I visited as a law student, I slept in a bed that was nice enough to give me a slot in their bed. There were three of us, um, and sometimes there were four of you, um, and people who had very little shared. Um, I also learned a lesson as a lady lawyer because I came down um, and the whole, a lot of people in town had come out to hear, to see a lady lawyer. They heard there was a lady lawyer in town and I had on my dungarees, my jeans, um, and my um, college clothes um, as, as, as a young person and they were so disappointed because that wasn't what their image was. <laughs> um, and I never went out in the field again without dressing up. Um, but things were extraordinarily poor um, and um, mean. And um, I mean, it was a total apartheid system. And um, people were sharecropping, they didn't have enough to eat. Um, and they lived in shacks, they had no rights, and fear was palpable. I mean, violence was rampant. Um, I, I saw 60 Minutes recently, and they were talking about Amet County and, and Herbert Lee, um, 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 the murder that went on down there, and I started laughing because every time we would go through Macomb or Amet County or Liberty, Mississippi, it was always on the floorboards um, because you didn't want to get caught in Amet at night, um, and it was a scary place. But the suffering was palpable, but again, the courage and the endurance and the grit of local people in Mississippi never ceased to inspire me um, and to amaze me. And I still try to figure out how to be half as good as, as, as those people were. Um, and they used to bug me to death even after I left Mississippi to do this, to do that, to do that. And they never gave up trying to make the world better for children, but it was terrible. Tell me a little bit about the role that you played in getting RFK uh, focused on the issue of poverty in Mississippi. Well, the poverty program began in the Office of Economic Opportunity in 1964, and the Head Start program um, was a key part of what was needed, and the state of Mississippi refused to take Head Start, so civil rights groups and church groups applied for it under a single exception under that law, ran one of the most wonderful Head Start programs in the nation. Um, 11,000 children, 3,000 new jobs outside the plantation structure and the state structure, and it was a revolution, and children had hope, and parents saw what their kids could do, and um, Senator Stennis realized what a revolution this could bring about in Mississippi, with all these poor black folk and children learning these radical things, and, and seeing black kids in their textbooks, and parents participating in their children's learning, and so he, um, said it was going to hold up all the money for the poverty program unless this program was defunded. So that was my first big lesson in federal state real politics because Senator Stennis um, and Senators Eastland um, and Representative Jamie Whitten were among the most powerful people in, in, in Congress. And so they told Sergeant Shriver in the Johnson White House that they didn't defund this program. They were going to um, cut off all this money. And we fought back. They, they cut it off initially and parents ran this program for four or five months. They immediately said that the program was wasting money and that we were you know, not, not using the money for what was intended. And there were hearings. And I got called to Washington by um, um, Senator Joe Clark and Javits and others to testify about the mismanagement of this wonderful Head Start program. And um, came, and then I invited them to come down to Mississippi and see, and to see how wonderful this was. There, there, you know, there may have been some small mismanagement, but nothing like what it was about. So they came into the hearing, and Bobby Kennedy came down, um, and with Bobby Kennedy came press um, to hold these hearings about the effectiveness of the poverty program, in particular the Head Start. And um, I thought I was going to testify on Head Start, but I don't know what moved me to talk about hunger. I guess I, guess I stayed out on the field a lot and was often visiting poor parents, and, and with the 
they were very angry in the state after the summer project of 64, and they really were encouraging people um, to leave the state if you were poor and you were sharecroppers, wanted you to get out of there. And they began to transfer over from food commodities, which is the federal food program that were free, to food stamps, which cost $2 a person, and people who had no income couldn't afford food stamps, and hunger and even starvation was increasing. And that's what came out of my mouth that day when the senators were there listening about the hunger. And there were a couple of Republican senators who said, um, Senator George Murphy and Senator Prouty from Vermont, that if people were hungry and starving, then we should do something about it. And the Democrats kind of got a little bit eager to make sure that they were not one-upped. And I had invited them to come up and see the empty cupboards and the, and the people who had nothing. And um, they said they'd do it. And that turned out to be very, very important because Robert Kennedy did take the press um, with them. And we went to visit poor sharecroppers, went through the houses, saw no food in the refrigerator. And that's when Robert Kennedy got um, to sit through a, a place, a, go went to a house where there was a baby with a bloated belly sitting on a dirt floor in a sharecropper shack, um, shack in Cleveland, Mississippi. And he tried to make that boy, that baby respond. The baby did no response. And I was very moved by him. And I just watched him become palpably angry um, in seeing this child who was clearly um, malnourished and even worse. And he came out, there were no television cameras. And he came out and he was furious um, and um, got a determination that he was going to get food down there. And, 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 and he went through all the rest of those houses and saw all the people with empty cupboards and empty refrigerators and children who had no lunch and had no breakfast. And he went back to Washington the next day to see Orwell Freeman, who was Secretary of Agriculture then with my husband, now husband, who was his legislative assistant, and said, Orwell, you got to go down there and get, and get some food down there. And you got to stop the food, stamp, the food stamp charges. And Orwell Freeman said, there are no people in America who um, are hungry and have no income. And he said, I just saw them, just went through there. But at any rate, Freeman didn't believe him, and so he sent his own staff back down with with my husband to go back to the same places and to see these people who had no income. Um, and he, Robert Kennedy, became a very big proponent of, of, of expanding food programs and out of getting a 60 Minutes um, piece that he um, never lived to see and getting badgering everybody in the world to kind of hold hearings. And he eventually made it clear that it wasn't just Mississippi where there was child hunger, but that it was all over the South and eventually all over the country. And it led to major, major reforms in food programs in the, in, in the, um, in the 70s. Um, and we virtually, I think, wrapped, wiped out hunger. And then the Reagan administration came in and took us backwards. But um, and look at where we are now. Um, I often comment that there was a New York Times piece last in the last six to nine months by Jason Farrell, front page of New York Times, that said that one in 50 Americans had no income. Um, that's some um, six million Americans, and were dependent on food stamps. Is there a basic safety net program? And I and not a peep. I keep calling. Did you all read this piece? Six million Americans with no income, um, and nobody seems to get upset about it. Um, and so we are back facing the same kinds of problems, but with so we need our Robert Kennedy, um, and we need our Martin Luther King. And the real question is, how do we get our country? Um, to just be, provide the most basic safety net for people. And how do we get our country to wake up? Right. The, um, that early political experience, did that play a role in your decision to come up here? I want you to talk about a little bit about coming up here and what you started here and why. I moved, well, because the, the, the hunger was going on. Dr. King got involved in the hunger issue. It was pretty clear in 1966, 67, that um, you had to address the social and economic problems um, if the political and civil rights were going to have meaning. Um, I wasn't winning a case if I won a school desegregation case. And the next day, my plaintiffs' names were um, tacked up on the telegram posts, and they were out of jobs, had no food, had no place to go, pushed off their plantations, were shot at. Um, and so you had to kind of address those issues of, of hunger and jobs and health and the quality of the education that they got. And um, that was um, given great impetus when that committee came down and, and, and Robert Kennedy and Joe Clark and others took on the hunger issue and Dr. King got engaged. And I would um, stay in touch with Robert Kennedy all during that period and on my way back 
After a visit to Washington, I stopped in, as I always did, to see him when I was here and then to see Dr. King on, in Atlanta on the way back to Jackson. And Robert Kennedy told me, after he asked me how things were going in Mississippi, and I was horrified by how slow everything was and how little progress. And by this time, the country was preoccupied with the Vietnam War and the money was going there. Johnson was preoccupied. He needed the help of his Southern Congress people and senators to fund that war. And so people were forgetting um, what was going on in these poor communities across the country. Um, and um, so my frustration with Robert Kennedy, and, and I, I shared my frustration with Robert Kennedy and told him I was going to see Dr. King on the way back to Jackson. And he said, tell him to bring the poor to Washington. And he was by this time running for president for the Democratic nomination. And, um, and um, we needed to let them people see the poor, see their, hear, hear their needs. And so I was the, the transmitter of this message. And Dr. King um, had a very, very modest office in Atlanta, and he was sitting by himself always, constantly at the end, trying to figure out what is the next step to take. And he was often depressed about what to do, he was depressed about the war. He saw the poverty was around him. He had helped us very much in the refunding battle of our Head Start program. And when I told him what Robert Kennedy had said to bring the poor to Washington, his face lit up. Um, and he, um, what did he say? I, it made me think that I was an angel delivering a message. And he went home and told Coretta that, you know, that this was the right thing to do. His staff didn't like it a whole lot, but bottom line was that that became the Poor People's Campaign um, and his mobilization. And there was a big split about whether the CLC or his organization should be focused on ending the war or whether it should be on the war on poverty. And obviously he chose the war on poverty, but it was so difficult for him with interim dissension um, and with his making that very courageous speech against the war at Riverside where everybody um, turned against him, the combination of talking about fair treatment for the poor, but he died in 1968. I moved to Washington um, to work on the Poor People's Campaign, um, and his last Sunday sermon was at the Washington National Cathedral, um, warning about the, he given the, gave them, talked about the parable of Dives, the poor man um, Lazarus and the rich man Dives, and warned that America um, was in danger of going to hell like Davies did, not because it was rich, he was rich, but because he refused his brother. And he called for this poor people's campaign at a time when there were 11 million poor children. Gosh, if he were living today when we've got 15.5 million poor children, I've no doubt that he'd be out here trying to call for and leading a poor people's campaign. His last Sunday sermon title, which he had called in on the day of his assassination to his mother in Memphis, um, he tell her he was going to preach on why America may go to hell the next summer, Sunday. Um, and um, it was, again, if we don't share our richness, um, the blessings of our rich, our wealth, with all of those who need the basic necessities of life, we're going to go to hell. And um, I think that um, we need to hear his prophecy um, and see how we can begin to respond, because our gap now between rich and poor is higher than it's ever been. And uh, the issue is how do we find our voice? How do we cut through this cacophony? How do we deal with this extraordinary period where we actually have the, you know, the redistribution of income upwards and poor children getting poorer and 80% not educated if you're black and poor and um, in schools um, and healthcare and homelessness rising. And what are we talking about? Giving more tax cuts to millionaires than billionaires. It's outrageous. I want you to tell me what this organization is what it's called, why you started it. The original organization was a public interest law firm that came out of the Poor People's Campaign. It was called the Washington Research Project, and I had been giving a check, and I was standing up in the bank to say, what are we gonna call this thing? I was trying to get here to prepare the, the policy papers for the Poor People's Campaign, and that was the Washington Research Project. Um, and after Dr. King's assassination, we stayed in business to try to implement um, many of the demands um, that the Pupil's campaign had raised, but we focused first on hunger, um, which was the prime thing. It was, a, 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 and um, when p other people got involved and we began to make progress, we moved on to the next thing, which was Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And I must say that it sounds like we're doing complete circles because we're still making the same demands, both on hunger and jobs and on Title I. But we had a public interest law firm for the first five years as a way of trying to see how we could enforce federal civil rights and poverty laws 
for the poor in places like Mississippi. But it was pretty clear that whatever you call black and poor was going to face a shrinking constituency and that we had to find new ways of, of tapping across race and class. And the Poor People's Campaign was a cross-racial campaign, whites, blacks, Native Americans, Latinas, um, seeking jobs, seeking income, seeking you know, education and a better life for their children. And so we've, in a sense, just picked up where the Poor People's Campaign left off. But we began to see that prevention and early intervention in children might be, and it was Head Start's impetus and its influence on me that might be the basis for what we should do. The day after Dr. King was assassinated, I had gone out into the schools because um, there were riots that had broken out all over America, including here in Washington. And I went out into the schools in the riot torn neighborhoods to talk to children and tell them not to loot, not to get arrested and not to lose their future, risk their futures. And a little boy, about 11 or 12, looked at me straight in the eye and said, lady, what future? Ain't got no future. Ain't got nothing to lose. And I've been trying for the last 40 years to prove that boy's truth. I'm wrong, and I'll spend the rest of my life trying to do that. I think of that boy all the time. I mean, I, and I, I, that boy's truth in this um, economically wealthy and militarily powerful but spiritually anemic nation is a truth that I'm trying to change and will change, spend the rest of my life trying to change. And, um, you know, here we are at a time when the chief national security issue facing this country um, is the failure of this nation to invest in its children where you've got a majority of all of our children who can't read and write and compute at grade level um, in fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade. And we're talking about budget deficits, cutting education, when children can't read and write, who's going to be our workforce? Where you've got millions of children without health care, where you've got millions of children without home and without food. I mean, we're fighting the wrong deficit. It's the human capital deficit that's going to do us in, and it's also our moral Achilles heel. It's our economic Achilles heel, and I am more mission-driven than I have ever been to say, wake up, country, um, because you're killing yourselves, and this is what's going to topple us as a nation. And so the, the urgency of the mission is, is, is so great, both because I love my country and want it to sort of realize and live up to its ideals, but because I see those little boys out there all the time. And the whole premise of the American dream is that your children are going to do better than you did, and our children and all races are not going to do better than we did. We're moving backwards. And in many ways, the black child faces one of the worst crises, if not the worst crisis, since slavery. Um, and we can't go backwards. We're about to watch this prison pipeline undermine the last 50 years of progress. If you combine 70% of literacy, um, I'm sorry, 70% children being born out of wedlock in the black community, and it's a problem that, that affects the whole society, if you look at one in three black boys going off to prison, 40% black children being born poor, and over 80% can't read at grade level in fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade, and 40% drop out, what is that? I mean, that is a new incarceration, that is a new slavery, that is a new apartheid. And so to watch it go back so quickly, and to watch those little boys grow, and while the nation has gotten wealthier and wealthier and more of that wealth has gone to the few at the expense of the many, it's, it's to watch America sort of lose itself and lose its soul and lose its edge, competitive edge. And so how do you keep yelling, wake up, wake up? I mean, you're fighting the wrong deficit and we're fighting the wrong war. It's the war right here. And the best way we're going to, in our world, lead um, in a world that's two-thirds non-white and two-thirds poor um, and is to recognize that it's what we are at home. And particularly now when um, black and brown and Native American children, children of color, are going to be a majority of our child population by 2019. You may not like them, but you're going to need them. So I'm, I'm sure I went on to the next thing too, but that's... Um. I want to ask you just a couple questions about the women's movement. Do you have uh, strong recollections of kind of the early women's rights uh, protests and the, you know, were you aware of the women's movement when it was first starting to form at around the same time that uh, you were involved in the civil rights uh, struggle? I was, um, and, um, but black women have always had to work, right? We've always, um, and, and Alice Walker calls us womanists, 
um, because but, but our agendas were not always the same. Um, and I've always felt very strongly about um, the need for bridges between the white women's movement, if you will, the more privileged women's movement, which was more about me and my freedom and my status, when the black women's movement um, um, was really about kind of how do we make sure that our children have enough to eat and how do we make sure that we have health care. And so there was, there was both, I supported the aspirations of the overall women's movement, but I often differed with them of the priorities within that. Um, and, um, and I'm glad it happened. Um, and it needs to continue to happen, and I hate the fact that the women's movement is somehow now beginning to be summed up with you guys again. I mean, we've come all these ways to sort of have women call you guys, um, but um, I'm probably the only person still that corrects people when they say that. Um, but I think that um, it played an important role and still has much to go, and women's rights are under attack now. But I think that the key that we have always felt here at the Children's Defense Fund is that since women have been the disproportionate parent, done the, pulled a, a disproportionate amount of the parenting in the black community, um, it was really about child care and um, early childhood experiences. It was about health care and that Medicaid was this, we've never taken a position on abortion because we felt there were enough people doing that, but the issue was what do you do to get health care? Because I've always thought reproductive rights was about the right to have a healthy child as well as the right to have no child if that's where you wanted to do. But we focused on that right to have healthy children. And I was much more into Medicaid expansions and health care and prenatal care and, and child health coverage um, and still am. Um, and so while there was a lot of range of support on, on specific issues, um, we've always focused on a and a, you know, a, a women's agenda that related to the, the working women, our mothers and our sisters and the folk that raised these children who were poor. Um, and, and in that sense, I think there was often a divergence, not always. And um, we did not take a lot of positions and we, you know, they used to get very angry um, when we would not take an, a, a position on abortion. I said, we have nothing new to add on that. I'm for all those children who are here and they have far fewer voices that are powerful to be heard. And so we've made progress on child care, which has helped all women. We've made progress on a lot of issues, including health care, that have helped everybody. Um, and I think that's been important, and the women's movement needs to keep pushing. Um, Betty Friedan was a very good friend. Gloria Steinem is a very good friend. And, um, and I think that and Dorothy Height, who was on our board for 31 years, was always with, with one foot in both camps. And so women um, and children, still are the folk that we've got to speak up for in this society because equality is still not a reality for many despite the extraordinary progress. When you talked earlier about your experiences both in Bennettsville and in Mississippi, you know, of not being accepted, taken seriously, some you know, open resistance and hostility to you, I'm wondering Obviously, that can be dispiriting, but does it also have like a motivating effect on one? Does it strengthen your resolve? You can't let other people define who you are. Um, and one of the lessons of my childhood with people of faith was that you're a child of God. You could look down on nobody, and nobody can look on you. Look down on you, and you cannot let other people define who you are. I happen to believe that every child is sacred, that I'm sacred and that I've got to respond to others in that way. And so um, it's, 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 it's something that has to ground children. We're teaching our children in freedom schools that there's something inside you that is so strong that nobody can touch that. So if they tell you that you're not good enough, that you can't make it, you just say, I'm going to do it anyway. And I think that trying to get young people and children to know that they are spiritual beings that can't be defined by men, by people of a different race, which is a myth, um, and that girls are as precious and sacred and smart, sometimes I think smarter than boys, um, that, that, that we, we, the measure of our success is inside. It's inside our hearts and heads. And, you know, and my two great role models are, are two brilliant slave women who are deeply grounded. Um, Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman, um, but they just, they had the, 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 the firm sense of who they were as human beings created by God that nobody else could touch. And here in this country and too often in our world, it's always, you're defined by things and by status. And I mean, sometimes I look at these budget debates, excuse me, and I say, who raised these people? I mean, I mean who, who said that it was okay? 
um, to take from poor babies in order to give, you know, have a third yacht or to have whatever. I mean, but, but so I think it's the, it's the grounding of our Judeo-Christian tradition and the teachings of my parents and the example of those extraordinarily great women in Mississippi who really believed in what the Bible said and, and, and that, 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 and, and that um, we were not creatures created by men, but we were creations of, of something higher than that. And so I try to remember that. Um, and, um, and not let other people dictate who they think you are and all this American materialism which Dr. King warned about and excessive individualism and excessive militarism, the need to, power, to lord it over others, the power, the money, um, the things he said would be our undoing and I must say um, I think I tend to agree with him. What is the most meaningful piece of advice you ever got? It was from my father, follow the need. God runs a full employment economy. And that service is the rent that each of us pays for living. And um, I've tried to sort of live that creed. What is the one piece of advice you'd give a young woman on having a work-life balance between your kids and your career? It's hard. And you've got to figure out how to do that. There's no blueprint. Um, but I think that the bottom line is that children have to come first. Um, if, if I had a choice between staying home with a sick child and having a business meeting, I would stay home with my sick child. Um, and it's just hard work. Um, and that you've got to have a support system and a community, but it's, it's, it's hard. But you can do it. What's the accomplishment you're most proud of? My children. What was your very first paying job? As a law student in the first year in law school at a law firm in New York when I was um, very involved with the Legal Defense Fund of the NAACP. Um, but my first paying job was when I went to Mississippi as a lawyer and I made $7,200 a year. I didn't know how I was going to live and pay off my loans. And I had never, I haven't saved as much money since then. I mean, but my rent was 30, my house was $92 a month. But the Legal Defense Fund of the NAACP, which is one of the great, great, great gifts of my life, paid me $7,200 a year to move back to Mississippi, and the second year, $5,000, and the third year, $3,500. But because Mississippi was so cheap, I saved money. Okay. Uh, which three adjectives best describe you? Persistent. Absolutely um, committed to seeing that every child is justly treated um, and um, determined, determined, persistent. I just don't give up. Um, and I have very deep beliefs about um, um, social justice, and, um, and that's dictated by my faith. And so um, um, I am, I guess I, I, whether it's caring or I'm just committed to trying to live one's faith um, through how um, children are treated in this world, um, but um, I'm never going to give up.